Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Randall Church. I'm going to invite you to come in the sanctuary and stand with us as we begin our time of worship together. someone next to you.
right, you friendly bunch. You can find your seat. Have a seat. Welcome to Randall Church. We're so glad you're here. My name is Pastor Brian. It is the post-Easter service. Well done. You are here post-Easter. Good job. We appreciate that. Welcome to Randall Church. We are so glad you're here. If you're new this morning, we want to particularly welcome you. There are connection cards uh, in the pew in front of you. We would love to know that you are here, ways that we can help you find your place here at Randall Church. There are offering uh, boxes in the back. If you've got a gift to give this morning, you can put those in there, or that connection card in there. We'll be sure to get back with you. If you've got prayer requests, questions, anything like that, uh, that connection card will be your ticket, and we will be sure to respond to that right away. But welcome to Randall Church. We are so glad you're here. A couple of announcements, things that are kicking off soon. Uh, Right now, uh, groups is what I want to particularly focus on. We started uh, this morning, but it's not too late. We have two new Sunday morning groups at 9 o'clock happening. One is a membership class. It's a seven-week class to help you become members here at Randall Church. We're actually going to be talking about that in our message this morning, actually in the next two messages. So uh, it is not too late for you. That'll be uh, sort of a call for those of you. If you've been part of our church for a long time, membership uh, is... Membership matters. We'll put it to you that way. Membership matters. We want you there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that is happening at 9 o'clock. The other group that's happening is what we're just calling the town hall group, and that town hall group is exploring the new proposed constitution and bylaws. On your way in, you might have seen them in the back uh, on our counter there. If not, you can grab them on the way uh, out the door this morning. These are the, this is the proposed uh, new set of bylaws and constitution that we hope, if, if, if we sense that it's still uh, in, the, in the right, if the spirit is moving uh, in that direction, to vote on that, the, those during the annual meeting on May 19th. And so what we're doing with that group is we're exploring different sections of the Constitution and bylaw, showing sort of the biblical foundation for each of the sections, and then really it's an open forum to allow you to ask questions, to wrestle with what's going on. It is in, in tandem with our sermon series. So we started a sermon series called Firm Foundations, and so each week we're going to be preaching on one of those biblical foundations, and then the next week in the group, we will then explore how it corresponds to our Constitution and bylaws. So it's a Q&A. There's a little bit of teaching. It's a really, we had our first one. It's a really nice time. So if any of the sections, if any of the, that, that content in the bylaws or the Constitution you really want to wrestle with and ask questions about, most of our elders uh, at different times are going to be there as well. So you can ask us anything. But again, we want to bring these before you uh, not in a spirit of just rubber stamp them and let's move forward. We really want our community to explore and wrestle and discern and pray over this together so that by the annual meeting, if the Spirit allows, that we might be able to together affirm uh, this, uh, this way that uh, the Lord is leading us to, to, be, to be the church and how we belong to the church together. So again, it doesn't have to be every week, but please, as much as you can, we'd love to see you there at 9 o'clock. If you're not becoming a member, if you want to become a member, come to the membership class, but uh, we'll be tackling a lot of the same topics there as well. But join us at 9 a.m. each Sunday morning up until the annual meeting on May 19th. Uh, our Good Neighbors uh, project, the Good Neighbors project is coming up fast, April 20th, Saturday, April 20th. We need you to sign up, though. If you and your family can participate in this uh, Saturday uh, uh, service project day, uh, there's kiosks in the back. Please sign up for something. We need, we need numbers now. Um, and if you've got questions, Bethany here, she'll be around. She'd love to answer any questions you have, uh, but we would love for you to get uh, uh, committed to it now so that we can make those right preparations. You can see all of that in the back afterwards. And then finally, Route 55, our senior fellowship, the last one of the seasons coming up April 21st. That's in a few weeks from now. So if you'd like to have a luncheon after the service, you're one of our seniors in, 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 the, in the community, sign up in the back at the kiosk as well for that. That'll be after the service on April 21st. Join them with that. I've got one last announcement, but to do that, I'm going to need a little help. So I'm going to ask Tim Stewart uh, to come on up. Once a month, we highlight one of our different partners, and Tim uh, and his family are, uh, are one of our partners with Campus Ambassadors, uh, a campus ministry uh, here in the Buffalo area. Tim is the director of the, of the UB campus and also has a, a national role helping with, I'm not allowed to say fundraising, right? That's a naughty word. It's, it's, it's uh, 
support raising. Uh, he he, he, he uh, 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 educated me on that uh, recently. So he is doing a lot going on, and we just wanted to highlight what's going on with you guys. So yeah, I mean, you're a, you're a college ministry, so a lot of your ministry revolves around a semester. So how have the last, this last year in, in the two semesters been going for you guys? Uh, terrible, thank you for asking. Okay. <laughs> no, things have been really good. Um, and to go back just a little bit, we had this pandemic thing a little while ago. Um, I would have to say that we probably had it better at UB than most people doing campus ministry anywhere else I know. Uh, God really blessed us during that season. We have a space on campus that we rent and we were able to use very effectively during that season. And since then, uh, God's been doing some really amazing things in the ministry, bringing a lot of news. To, we're actually doing a freshman Bible study for the first time and Man, that group has been so cool. It's been so great to meet all these brand new students who, and we're just getting into really basic foundational stuff, and they're really eating it up. That's awesome. And you, uh, you just came back from actually from a missions trip. We we got uh, coffee the other day. You were telling me about it. So tell a little bit about uh, what that trip was and the fruit you saw come out of that. Yeah, absolutely. We went to Kentucky for the second year in a row. Uh, a couple years ago, they got hit by an F4 tornado in Mayfield, Kentucky, and. Uh, many people were killed, many homes were destroyed, uh, many of the properties that were destroyed were rental properties and the landlords were not rebuilding. And so these communities were going to lose a lot of people who did not own land in that community. And so Samaritan's Purse has stepped in. This is actually the largest project Samaritan's Purse has ever done anywhere. And they're building over 70 brand new homes in this community. Uh, that they are giving to people who have gone through a program to get them ready for home ownership. And we got to see four homes dedicated to owners while we were there doing landscaping, painting, floorboards, you name it. Uh, they let the volunteers do a little bit of everything. And uh, th that really was the cherry on the top for many of the people on our team was seeing people actually receiving uh, their first home. And finally, we, um, I know you guys, are, you talked about the pandemic, that there is a conference you guys used to do that the p pandemic kind of didn't slow down, it stopped. But you guys are, are, are uh, recharging that, you're getting that going again, and how can we be a part of that starting next Sunday? Sure. So for many, many years, we held an end of the school year conference called Infusion. Uh, at that point, it was a six-day conference that we would get together over the Memorial Day weekend, and we would just go away. We'd go to a camp. Uh, we'd have college students from all over the Northeast come together, and we would get into the Word. And so, sadly, Infusion kill, or the pandemic killed that conference for a number of years, but we're finally bringing it back. And so uh, this coming Memorial Day weekend, we're going to be once again drawing students from across the Northeast here uh, to come together to get into the Word. Uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about, uh, Paul Decker, uh, former lead pastor here at Randall Baptist, who's been on staff with us in Campus Ambassadors for, I think, 15 years now, uh, he's going to be our core course teacher this year, and over the course of that conference, he's going to take everybody through the Book of Romans. Uh, and as we've been promoting that to the students, they've been very excited about that. And so um, one thing that we've done for a number of years before the pandemic is supporting Infusion with, uh, with a luncheon. And so tell us a little bit about, that's going to happen next Sunday. Tell us a little bit about what, what you're planning to do and how we can help with that. Sure. So we're going to bring a whole bunch of college students here next week, and we're going to prepare a nice meal for you guys. Uh, this is a free meal, okay? So feel free to just come and eat and enjoy. You're going to come, you'll meet college students, you're going to hear some of their testimonies, you'll learn a little bit more about what's coming up here, and uh, if it's a blessing to you and a joy to you and you want to give to the scholarship account to help college students go on this retreat, wonderful. But please don't let finances be the thing, you don't have to pay for this meal, just come. Eat, enjoy, it's gonna be a really nice time. We want our college students to meet you guys and engage with you as well. And so uh, we're just gonna put out a nice spread for you. It'll be a pancake, sausage. Uh, we do cinnamon sugar apples that are delicious. It's, it's, it's a really nice meal. And uh, yeah, we're gonna lay out the ministry to you guys, show you what's going on. And only, only 
if it's a joy and a blessing to you and you want to help get these college students, because the cost of the retreat per student is $300, okay? And so for many of them, that's a bit of a stretch. And so I tell the college students for our retreats, uh, for, for our, the missions conference that we just uh, went on to Kentucky, uh, that we will never ever allow money to be the thing that keeps them from going. And in all these years, we've never turned down anybody because of something as silly as finances. And so uh, we tell the students, you cover all that you can, we will find the rest. Yeah. So come, hear at me now, come hungry tomorrow, next Sunday, not tomorrow, we will not feed you tomorrow, but come next Sunday, there's going to be pancakes and sausage after the service. You're going to meet college kids, you're going to hear more about the ministry. It's just a fun time. So come, we'll be there. We hope you'll be there too. Uh, let's pray for these guys, and hopefully you'll be able to come next week and hear even more and meet some of the students of what's going on. Lord, I do pray uh, for Tim. I thank you for his ministry. I pray for his, I pray for the whole family. I pray for the stewards. I thank you that they are a part of our church. They're part of uh, uh, the core of our body. And we thank you that we can support them and send them out, Lord, to a, a unique mission field, um, a college campus, Lord a place we continually, um, progressively can't get into, but Lord, we can send missionaries, we can send partners in. So we thank you that uh, Tim uh, and his team are, um, are saying yes to your calling. We thank you for an encouraging year, uh, particularly as we move away from COVID more and more. Uh, continue to bless uh, their ministry. May there be fruit that comes of it. And Lord, continue to show us ways we can support. We thank you for um, the ways in which we're going to be able to connect with them next week. We love you. We love them. We thank you for it. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can you give Tim a round of applause, everybody? Thank you. <laughs> All right. And with that, would you stand? Let's continue to worship this morning. And kids, you are dismissed to King's Kids. In Psalm 34, it says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And later in verse 8, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him.
sing out praise to the Lord. Thank you for your presence with us this morning, and we lift your name in this place. We give you all the glory that's your due. Amen. Amen. Would you remain standing as we go before the text this morning? Before we do that, let's start with our prayer called Shema out of Deuteronomy 6, a way for us to recommit ourselves to focus in before we hear from God's very word. Say it after me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. We are in a, uh, we are in a sermon series called Firm Foundation. So this is a topical series, so we are not in one uh, book of the Bible. Today we are going to be in 1 Corinthians, though. So if you have your Bible, flip over to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, from 17 to 28. This is the word of the Lord. It says this. Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church... I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be fractions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. 
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was portrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then, and so, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. me again. You get a lot of me this morning. So like I said, last week we started this, uh, this sermon series on firm foundation, we're calling it, and we are spending the next seven weeks looking at foundational elements of a local church. And we're doing this to help us introduce the proposed new constitution and bylaws. We really do want this to be a community discerning time for us, and so we're going to take the next seven weeks to look at these foundational elements of a local church, which will correspond to each of the sections of our new co- proposed constitution and bylaws. It'll be a chance for us to discern all of that together. And then, like I said, the next Sunday in our nine o'clock group, we will then explore what we had discussed uh, in the message the week before. So next week at 9 a.m., if any of this is uh, spurs something in you, join us at 9 a.m. We'll be discussing it and asking questions as we go. So last Sunday, Easter Sunday, Pastor Milo, he focused on the firm foundation, the solid rock, the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that this is of first importance. This is what we build our church on. Sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel, as First Timothy, as Paul implores Timothy, as he is encouraging him to continue uh, holding firm to the word and to preach it. He gives him a list of things to avoid, and he says else that is not in accordance with sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel. This is the foundational piece that we build our church on. And that, of course, then corresponds with the first section of our new constitution, proposed constitution, on our statement of faith. The things that we will stand firm on, the things that we believe is a non-negotiable in what it means to be a Christian, a member of his body. That's sort of the rhythm and flow of what's going on. So next week, we'll start covenants and we'll address the next section in our, me- in our sermons uh, after that. Today, then, we tackle the second uh, section of our proposed constitution, and that is covenant. The idea of covenants and where we see that biblical foundation for it. Covenant is the way that God creates and shapes his people. It is the way in Scripture that he creates and shapes his people. And of course, it starts all the way back at the beginning. You know me by now. We got to go backwards before we go forward. Flip over with me to Genesis chapter 15. Flip over if you've got your Bibles with you this morning. We'll be flipping around a little bit. Genesis 15. We're going to be dealing with a guy named Abram. Later, he will be renamed to Abraham, who is the founding father of God's people, the founding father of his people. And his story actually starts a few chapters earlier in Genesis 12, when the Lord tells him to go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will make a great nation. So from the beginning, 
the Lord appears to, speaks to Abram and says, I want you to go, and from you, I'm going to create this nation. I, you're, you are going, uh, through you, you are going to be the one who I'm going to create my people from. And then uh, Abram, he goes on a journey for the next couple of chapters. The rest of chapters 12 through 14 tells the story of Abram building a new life as he waits for the promise the Lord has given him. But now we get here in Genesis 15, and Abram has arrived, he's made it, but he's getting a bit antsy. He's getting a bit frustrated that he hasn't seen the promise that God has delivered, that has given to him. And here's where we pick up the story. We're going to pick it up in verse 8. Abram and God have been kind of going back and forth for a second. And here we get to verse 8, and he says, But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? How, How will I know that this promise is going to come true? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. And Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down to the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation that that serve as they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites had not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So here we have Abram asking God, I I did what you said. I left my land. I've arrived here in this place that you told me to go. Are you going to keep your promise? From me is a a people going to come. Are you going to create your people, your nation from me? And God says, all right, I'll double down on it. Bring the animals, which is a little strange for us because we don't get that context, but you wouldn't usually say this, like, hey, do you promise that? Yeah, 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 okay, here's what you're going to do. Go get some animals, go cut them all up, right, put them on each side, and uh, then we'll go from there, right? And yet Abram knows exactly what's going on here because he's part of that culture and he knows what's going down. A covenant is being cut before him. God says, go get the animals. You see, a covenant is different than any other type of agreement. It is not a handshake, a pact, a treaty, or a contract. In fact, we have very little examples in our day of what a covenant is. The only main one that we know of that we still practice today is the one of marriage. Marriage is the one covenant we still kind of recognize and understand. But most of the time, we do not engage in covenants anymore in our day and age. But covenants were one of the primary ways that you uh, engaged, particularly if a greater party needed to connect, needed to uh, establish a relationship with a lesser party, covenants were used in order to decide and to arrange the terms of how this relationship would go. So covenants have distinct marks. They have distinct ways in which they are different than anything we know of in our day today. One of the, one of the marks of a covenant is that a covenant was highly relational. Highly relational. I recently, uh, our lawnmower needed to be uh, serviced. It needed like a tune-up. And so we brought it to a local kind of small motor shop and we Handed the, we handed the lawnmower over, and they did their work, and then they said it was ready, right? And I came back, and they handed me back, not literally, they pushed back, right, the lawnmower, and I, they, in exchange, I gave them money. And then they helped me load it into my car, 
and I drove away, and I will probably never see that person again in my life. Right? Because that's what a contract is. When you do, when you do a contract, it's highly Ill, 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 irrelational. No, that's not right. It's not relational. There it is. It's transactional. Right? Most of our relationships, when we're agreeing to terms with someone, we are transactionally uh, ha- establishing this relationship. You do work on whatever I need done at my house or my lawnmower. You give it back fixed. I give you, ba- I give you money. We kind of go our separate ways, and I don't speak to you again. It would actually be weird if I said, oh, thanks for the lawnmower. Hey, what are you doing after work? Right? That guy would be like, what are, you, what are you talking about? That would be weird, right? Or if your plumber finished something in your house and they got done and you were like, thanks so much, man. Hey, what are you doing Friday night? You want to hang out? The plumber would be like, no, I don't, who are you? I don't know you, right? Because that's a contract. That's, that's something you're agreeing to. It's very transactional. A covenant, on the other hand, is highly relational. Highly relational. What separates a covenant than other agreements is the ongoing relationship after the terms have been agreed to. Covenantal parties view each other as those who were bound together indefinitely. Indefinitely. Number two, a covenant is different. One of the marks of a covenant is that it's ceremonial. You know the day you enter into a covenant the day before you were not in a covenant, and the day after you were. There is a distinct ceremonial moment where you enter into it. Most of our relationships don't have a start date. When you think of some of your best friends, right, there isn't usually a day you can point to and be like, that was the day we became friends, right? Maybe you had something kind of funny happen, and you were like, oh, I really like this person, but it would be actually really weird if you were getting to know, like, a coworker or someone on your street or something, and you were hitting it off, and things were going, and then you'd go up to them and go, "Um, I'd like to formalize our relationship. I'd like to formally invite you to be my friend, so when can we make this official? When can you make that formal? Right? We don't do that. Nine-year-old boys, they do that. My son, he just came back from a birthday party yesterday, and he was all excited. He's like, Mom, I asked this kid to be my friend, and he said yes. And we're like, that's awesome, buddy, right? Because nine-year-olds, they kind of understand, like, hey, are we, we got to define the relationship here. Hey, we're jumping on the trampolines together. You want to be my friend? Yeah. You want to be my friend? Yeah. Right? And they know it. There's like a moment. But for the rest of us in, as adults, we don't do that, right? Because relationships happen naturally, right? They, you kind of ease into them. And in fact, if you were that direct and that formal, you might scare the person off, right? If you were overly formal with trying to enter into a friendship with someone, it just kind of naturally happens. And you can't look back on most of your friendships. You don't look back and know the date and time that it happened. You just look back and realize, oh, we're friends, right? Oh, oh, that, it just kind of naturally happened. A covenant, though, is ceremonial. It has a start to it. A friendship develops, and a covenant is entered into. You enter into a covenant, which has a distinct ceremony and date and time. Our text says at the end, on that day, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. There was a date, a moment, a ceremony where they made vows and commitments. Like I said, the the one area of our lives today where we still understand this concept of covenant is the covenant of marriage. You know the day you get married. On July 6, what was it, 2000, I can't remember, 2003, I can't remember. 2007, that's right, 7707. Hey, I at least got the date. On July 6th, I was not married to Molly. On July 7th, I was, right? If you, if you ask me, when did you get married? When did you enter into a covenant? I can tell you the day. I can't tell you the year, obviously, but I can tell you the day. That was the day we entered into a covenant. So a covenant is highly relational. It's indefinite. In where it goes. And it's highly ceremonial. You enter into it. One day you aren't in one, and the next day you are. Lastly, a covenant is cut. A covenant is 
cut. We saw a couple of that word a couple times. This is where the huffer and the goats and the ram and the animals all come into display. The Hebrew describes a covenant not as making a covenant, but cutting a covenant. You cut a covenant because the cut is represented in the animals. A covenant requires blood. To enter into a covenant requires blood. And the reason that it requires blood is because it's a symbolic act that says this, that says, for the lesser party, for the lesser party, it is symbolically saying, if I break the terms of this covenant, this is what you can do to me. So whenever you enter into a covenant, whenever you cut a covenant, there is some fashion of blood that is needed. And for Abram, these pieces would have been put on two halves. The blood would run down the middle, and there'd be what's called a blood path. A blood path was actually created as the two halves were put on each side. The blood ran down the sides, and a blood path was established. And the idea was, the expectation was, is that the lesser party would walk, would pass between the pieces. They would walk between it, walk through the blood path as a way of saying, if I, the lesser party, if I break the terms of this covenant, this is what is to be done of me. There is no more serious commitment than that of a covenant. A covenant is relational, a covenant is ceremonial, and a covenant is cut. So we see in the story, Abram gets the animals. He cuts them in half and arranges them out opposite of each other, and the blood path is formed. But there is a problem. Whose move is it? Who's the lesser party? Whose responsibility is it to walk between the pieces? Of course, it's Abram. But he knows that he'll never be able to keep his end of the bargain. In fact, one chapter later, he already breaks it. One chapter, it'll only take one chapter for him to miss, put his trust not in the Lord anymore, put himself uh, in front and run after another way than God tells him. It's going to take him one chapter to turn his back on God. He knows he can't walk between that blood path. He knows he's a dead man if he does. In fact, I love that little, uh, uh, that, uh, little detail we're given that the, 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 the birds of prey, the vultures, come around the carcasses and he has to kind of like shoo them away. What it implies is that he does it, he, he sets the whole thing up, and then he freezes. And he waits long enough that the birds actually recognize there's something dead around and come down. He is stalled out, waiting, because he knows if one toe hits that blood, he is a dead man. He's going to break that covenant in one chapter, and fear and dread overtake him. So while Abram is greatly distressed and troubled, God puts him in a deep sleep and a flaming torch and a smoking pot pass between the halves. Now, in the Bible, fire and smoke always symbolize the presence of the Lord himself. And so who walks between the pieces? God does. What he says is, hey, I know you're going to break it. You deserve to walk through the pieces, and this is what you deserve. And yet, because my covenant, my promises are true, that even when you fail, I'll walk through the pieces instead. It will be my blood that's on the line for this covenant to continue to move forward. And 2,000 years later, 2,000 years ago, God kept his promise. Flip on over with me now to Luke chapter 22. A covenant is a way God creates and shapes his people. It's the way God creates and shapes his people. Luke 22. God's people, the nation, will be fulfilled and God will walk between the pieces himself. Starting in verse 19. And Jesus took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant, or the renewed, the fulfilled covenant. You see, God does keep his promise, but the blood isn't going to be with goats and heifers and lambs anymore. God is going to keep his promise to say, it will be my blood that will continue this covenant forward to establish my people, the fulfilled people of God, the church. The fulfilled people through my blood, this covenant, this new, this renewed, this fulfilled covenant continues. But it's a better covenant now. As Hebrew says, it's a better covenant now because it's everlasting my blood will be f- sufficient for all. And it has all the same markings as the old covenant. Jesus' covenant is highly relational. It's indefinite. Hebrews says it. You don't have to keep, uh, you don't have to keep sacrificing bulls and goats anymore because my blood, the covenant that is now in my blood, it, it, it's one for all. It's it. It's indefinite. And Jesus' covenant is highly ceremonial, not just in the establishment of the Lord's Supper the night before, but as he hangs on a cross, you know the moment when he says it is finished. There was a time that we were out, we were not in Christ, and then there was a time where we are. And of course, Jesus' covenant is cut with his blood. So each time we partake the Lord's Supper, what we do is we actually remember that the blood of Jesus is how this new covenant was established. This cup of the new covenant in my blood. Every time we come to the table, we remember, ah, the covenant, the promise, it stands forever because it was cut with Jesus' blood. That's what we do at the table. We will come as his people to go, ah, this is how he established us. This is how he created us as a people, with a covenant in his blood. Covenant is the way God creates his people, but, ah, here we go now, covenant is also then the way that he shapes his people. Now that gets us back to 1 Corinthians 11. Flip back over there with me. Now we've established that. Now we start to make sense of what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 11. You see, Paul is addressing a local church that is not living up to its calling. And this calling has expectations. Paul has expectations for this local church. This is why he is condemning it. It's why he is he's angry. It's because there is a calling that this church has, and they're not living up to it. What are some of the things, what are some of the expectations that this church should have that we find in 1 Corinthians 11? Well, first, and it's, 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 it's pretty simple, really, they're expected to gather. In fact, if you see it in the passage, it says it three different times. Paul's really trying to highlight that. When you gather, he says. He says it three times. Not if you gather, or whenever you feel like gathering, but when you gather. Hey, local church, he's not addressing, and note this here, he's not addressing the universal church right now. He's writing to a specific church in a specific time in a specific place. And his expectations of them is that they will gather. Hey, when you gather, three times. But not just to gather for gathering sake, but there are certain uh, things, expectations, rhythms to what the gathering would be. We see that there needs to be unity within the gathering. He says, it is not for the better, but for the worse that I'm writing to you, for I hear that there are divisions among you. He calls it fractures a little later. So his full expectation is not only will you gather, but you will be unified as a church. There won't be fractions and divisions and people over here that kind of keep to themselves and people over there and that that there's infighting and there's something going on, but that this, this gathered community would have unity to it. And connected with that is they are unified because they care for one another. Notice what he says. He says, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you spies the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? You see, the rich were bringing their food before the Lord's Supper, and they were eating and drinking with no care for the poor or for those who had very little to contribute. And so this care had a physical aspect to it. You're not actually meeting the needs of the community, or particularly when you're gathering, you're actually fractioning off according to socioeconomic means and gains. And this is, not, this is not good, Paul says. He's got expectations. The scriptures have expectations for this gathered community. That there would be unity, and the unity comes because we are caring for each other physically. And look at this, we're also caring for each other relationally. He has a concern that those who don't have as much are being humiliated. So there's like this relational aspect to it. He's not just like, well, yeah, throw them a bone, give them their food, but then just don't. No, no, he's actually concerned about their, emo- their, their, their relational, emotional state. They give them honor just because they don't have as much as you. No, no, we're not here to humiliate. We're here to honor. In a, so we're, we're caring for one another. And I, I'd like to just offer, lastly, I think we see that there's an expectation that there would be spiritual, that we would be intentional about our spiritual maturity. He actually, at the end, calls us to examine ourselves. That we actually should be reflective, intentionally reflected, reflect, reflective in who we are, where we're at, where our sin might be, where we might be tempted to break unity, where we might be tempted not to care, why we may be tempted to, be, uh, to create fractions, where we might be tempted not to gather, and then, and then and do some self-reflection, allow the Holy Spirit to come in and examine ourselves and be ready for that. And that's on each of us to own that, to examine ourselves, to know ourselves, to be intentional with our spiritual maturity so that the whole church might be what? Built up. So Paul has these expectations for his church. Paul has expectations for God's church. The scriptures call us to think. And what is the basis does Paul use for these expectations? What, is, what does he point to to say, and here is why you are to do these things? He says it right there in the middle. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. So this for, that word for, us that he is giving the reason for why we should conduct ourselves in this way. Why that community should conduct themselves in this manner. Here it is. Here's the for. Here's why you should do that. The new covenant. The table. The basis he gives is the heart of the Lord's Supper. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. You see, God's people gathered in local churches are created by this new covenant and shaped by this new covenant. We are a new covenant people, and so therefore we covenant not just with the Lord, but we covenant with each other. It isn't just a vertical uh, uh, promise, a relational covenant with God, but it then supersedes uh, any of our own individual wants or needs so that we come in covenant with one another. The new covenant creates the people of God who therefore in covenantal community with one another. Paul has expectations, and then when he gives the reason for them, he goes, look at the Lord's Supper. It's the covenant. You, you covet, God has covenanted and created you as a people, and that same covenant now shapes you as a people to live in covenantal community with one another. In other words, when a local group of believers comes together to form a church, they are bound to God by the new covenant, and therefore they are bound to each other by that covenant as well. The covenant that makes us belong to God also makes us belong to one another. And so our commitment to each other in a local church is a covenantal commitment. I am covenantally bound to you, my brothers and sisters, because of the covenant I have with God. Here are the expectations, Paul says, and the basis for that. Here it is. Here it is. The table. The cutting of a covenant 
in Jesus' blood that enables us to do that. And this covenant we have with each other, friends, it has all the same markings as well. It has all the markings. This covenantal community, it's relational. It's not transactional. A church should never be transactional. often does, where our participation in a local church comes down to goods and services that this leadership can provide, and you pay for it with tithes and volunteerism, and then when we no longer meet your needs, then you're gone. It's like a membership at the Y. Right? You just, when the basketball schedule doesn't work for me anymore, all right, membership, I'll just pause it for a week. Right? It's not, this is not transactional. This is highly relational that is indefinite. We are bound one another through the table. Through the table. Highly relational. A household, a family, a body that commits to each other indefinitely. This covenantal community is ceremonial. It necessitates a moment when you commit. It requires a covenantal commitment, a vow to gather, to be unified, to care, both physically and relationally, to be intentional with our spiritual maturity, among other things. So in that way, membership matters. Membership is just the word we use for covenantal commitment. That's it. So if the word membership throws you off, throw it out. What we mean is, have you covenantally committed ceremonially committed to this, where you get up before God and others and say, for better, for worse, for sicker or poorer, till death do us part, or we move away. We'll let you go if you move. Feeling smothered yet? Good. Because it's a covenant. And finally, a covenant community, our covenant community is cut. And just like Abram, we know we'll never be able to keep our end of the bargain. If it were up to us to keep this covenantal thing going, we would be dead in our tracks. We deserve to be slaughtered like the animals of the Old Testament. A covenant requires blood. And yet Jesus Christ passed through the pieces. And on the cross, he declared it was finished. And through his blood, a new covenant was cut so that we might become his covenantal people together. A covenant is the way that God creates and shapes his people. It is the way that he creates and shapes his people. And so, friends, that brings us to the table. Let's go before the table. I'd like to call the band forward. Communion ushers, you also can come at this time. Friends, I love this community and I have covenantally committed to it and you have as well. Many of you has as well. And so we come to the table and if you are a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to this table as well because there is a universal church that you are a part of as well and so you are welcome to this table regardless of your local affiliation. But we come to the table to remember the new covenant, that God creates his people with the covenant. Just as Abram cuts a covenant with blood and establishing Israel, the people of God, Jesus cuts a new covenant with his blood, establishing the church, the fulfilled people of God. And God shapes his people from this covenant. And so we are committed to each other indefinitely by the same covenant, to gather, to be unified, to care, And so we must examine ourselves before we go to the table. I want to give you a minute now. If something stirs in you, if something, uh, you know that there's something that you, you need to deal with, with you and God, do that. Do that. And then let's come to the table together. Give you a minute.
Holy Spirit, as you're just doing your work now, God, would you come? Would you show us where we've fallen short of our covenantal com- uh, commitment to one another? Lord, will you show us where we fall short in our covenantal commitment with you? And may we come again to remember that you walked through the pieces. That with your blood, this covenant was cut. Not because of anything we could have done, not because we work harder or try harder or do better, but only because we fall, just like Abram, we fall into fear and dread, knowing we'll never cut, never be able to, to commit to it, and yet you walk the pieces for us so that we might be in right relationship, covenantal relationship with you that allows us to be in covenantal relationship with one another. So Lord, as we take the bread, we take the cup, may we remember. And so Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, when he took the cup after supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's do that together now, friends.
the body of Christ, broken for you, do this in remembrance of him. The blood of Christ, cut and shed for you, for the new covenant of which we belong. Let's pray. God, we come guilty, covenant breakers, and yet you have made a way. You've passed through the pieces. But may we continue to live into your calling to be a covenant people. May we commit to each other, love one another, build each other up, care and unity gathering. May we live into your calling as your covenant people. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. Lastly, I would say again, if you aren't a covenantal member of our church, I'd ask that you'd pray about that. We have a shortened, now six-week uh, gathering on, at 9 a.m. This would be a chance for you to come learn, grow, meet, so that you could have that ceremonial covenantal moment with us. If you've been here for a while, now's the time. Join us. And again, if you want to explore these covenantal themes, next Sunday at 9 a.m. we'll be there. If you're not a member, if you are a member and you want to continue to explore these themes, we'll be there to answer questions. But we pray the Lord bless you and keep you as we go forth as his covenantal. Would you stand as we worship now? Let's sing this together. My Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I Purchase my power.
we finish out our service together this morning, let's read this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Hope you all have a great day.